to discuss the release of a psychopath into our town. Sweetheart. Hello, darling. You should be rotting to death in a prison cell. Just die. Anna. Oh. Murderer or murderess? Which do you prefer? I am a Viking! Oh, your life post-prison is going really well. You're like the queen. I feel like the queen. This is a film about the past, the present, and the future. It's the story of a unique collaboration between 12 young musicians, a renowned conceptual artist, and one of the world's most truly iconic bands. New Order have always aggressively pursued the future. It was uh, quite radically different. It's never been done before, to my knowledge. What this project is, it's not about nostalgia. We're trying to work at what can be done now. We're trying not to look backwards. But for this project, New Order and their collaborators had to reflect on and deconstruct the band's history to create something very new. We knew it was going to be difficult, but it took us all by surprise. Rehearsing, finding the technology to make it work, finding the players to do the shows. It's kind of a concert, but it's kind of not a concert at the same time. And that's, for me, what's interesting. What this project kind of encapsulates is an extraordinarily grand and long story. The convergence completes, to some extent, a cycle and takes in an awful lot along the way. It's not entirely being fun. A lot of it has been quite traumatic, but most of us are still here. I think it's because we've worked it out together as a group of people. This story is a celebration of one of the most original bands in history and a rare chance to enter their private world, their artistic processes, and share in the creation of a collaboration unknowingly decades in the making. I don't think anyone can accuse us of dwelling in the past. We're not that kind of band. The making of this collaboration, it was a process of reinvention that brought us back here some four decades later. So what is a notable place in our history? We're at the old Granada TV building in central Manchester, and this is where we had our first television performance. On the wall, it says here, 20th September 1978, Joy Division TV debut, Love Will Tears Apart. But that's wrong, isn't it, Steve? Strictly speaking, it is incorrect, yes. Factually incorrect. So they're now first Only slightly wrong. Only two, slightly just wrong. two facts there. It's yeah. by implication. The first fact is yeah. correct. Yeah. 20th September 1978, Joy Division TV, we put a tick there. Yeah. Correct. 
Second fact, Love Will Tear Us Apart. We've not even written it by then, had we? No, no. It was uh, Shadow Play. In the shadow play, acting out your own death, knowing no more. The assassins all grouped in four lines, dancing on the floor. It was less than two years after the, that TV debut that Ian Curtis, our uh, singer, took his own life. It was extremely tragic, but also a really strange period for us. For our second Joy Division album, Closer, and our single, Love Will Tears Apart, were climbing up the charts. But the rest of us were trying to work out what to do next. This is where we got the title for Love Will Tears Apart yeah. from. <laughs> Yeah, we, we looked at yeah. it and thought, that would be a good title for a song. <laughs> yeah. When um, Joy Division were on television, I was away um, in a geography trip, so I didn't see it at all, so I was really annoyed. <laughs> Tell us about your geography trip. Well, it was in Liverpool. <laughs> Remember it well, Tom? Uh, six years old, not really, no. No, living in I France, was, uh... no. <laughs> <laughs> I was four at the time. I was ten. <laughs> Steve was nine. <laughs> <laughs> that Joy Division TV debut was the fateful outcome of our first meeting with Tony Wilson, the Granada TV presenter. But more importantly, he was a passionate advocate of new music at a kind of youth scene in Manchester. Seeing as how this is the programme which previously brought you first television appearances from everything from the Beatles to the Buzzcocks, would you like to keep our hand in and keep you informed of the most interesting new sounds in the North West? We'd done a gig at um, Rafters, I think, in Manchester. It was like a Battle of the Bands competition, and Ian had had a few drinks, and he went up to Tony and said, Wilson, you... How come you never play our, uh, play our records or put us on TV? Gave him a bit of verbal, you know, which Tony loved. And then uh, we did the gig, and apparently it was a very memorable gig. And in fact, Tony liked that concert so much, he um, formed a record company, Factory Records. The rest is history. It really is history, yeah. Factory Records was Joy Division's record label. And was a record label unlike any other. It was more of an idea than a professional record label in the early days. Tony Wilson was the impresario. Everybody who was involved were kind of drawn in to this solar system, at the heart of which was Tony being energetic and magnetic as a personality. I was fairly major writer on the music press. I could get big features. So he helped me to get a job with Granada Television. The kickback was that I would write about his groups. In some ways, even at that stage, be, be a sort of curator of what was going on. It's part of being one of these people who were orbiting around Tony. Years later, we got asked to do the Manchester International Festival. This seems really fitting to play here. and. Granada TV reminds us of Tony, and it was a, a kind of a, you know, a homage to Tony, really. The choice of venue for the MIF project might have been an unusual nod to the past for us, but the concept was something really new. Part concert, part artwork, the performance involved us, a visual artist, an army of technicians, and more than a dozen young musicians. The studio where we did it looked a bit more like this, didn't it, really? Did it? Without a doubt, New Order are at the point in their career where they are afforded the luxury of going through the motion, but not with this. This draws them into the universe of the Manchester International Festival, which has a criteria to bring together previously unimaginable projects and combinations of individuals who had not worked together before. Manchester International Festival is a biannual event in which they have various kinds of artists 
from all over the world, Hansi International. MAF is first and foremost a festival of entirely new work, which is pretty much unknown in the world of big city festivals. MIF is probably at its best when it's supporting artists to do something that they haven't done before. That might be a new kind of collaboration. It might be working in a different art form. It might be just pushing the boundaries of what they do. That's the whole point of the festival, to do something different and not do a gig, which we could have easily have done and it would have been a lot easier. The first part of the process was really just emptying everyone's minds of what had previously been done and how being, these things should work and filling that vacuum with just a lot of ideas. New Order then came up with more or less this idea that they would like to do a synthesizer orchestra. It was quite a complicated thing to pull off. Yes, quite complicated. Synth orchestra, what's that? How is that going to work? Steve enjoys the technical challenge anyway, didn't you? Yeah, had a great time doing it. <laughs> I had a Just great time doing it. You can spend it, yeah. even more hours in your really, studio. I really, 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 really enjoyed it. Enormously. Well, you like being in your studio. Yeah, I like being in bed as well. <laughs> Bernard had a rough idea with the, uh, the, the grids, the boxes. The idea at the root of it, very much from Bernard, was the idea of the wall of synthesizers. That was the very first thing that came up with this project. From a line drawing, it seemed pretty straightforward. Just build a set and put people in, in the cells, you know. Stick a keyboard in each cell, but the devil's in the detail, and there was a lot of detail. The five original Manchester concerts in 2017 were apparently a great success. So now, despite the complexity, we've decided to do it all again. It's a bit nerve-wracking. We're not just leaving our hometown, but we're also taking it into spaces that are a lot less accommodating than TV studio. The whole thing is so ambitious and it doesn't fit into anyone's category. So it's not like New Order's agent could phone up one of the big rock promoters in any major city in Europe and say, right, I've got a New Order gig for you. But New Order weren't going to compromise. So that kind of cut down the number of venues and organisations that would take the project on board. So it ends up being Torino and, and Vienna. It's got freshness to it, you know. And it's uh, quite radically different from the normal set we do, so I'm oh, glad we're doing it again, yeah. That's yeah. a good thing about the gigs coming up, that we have done it before last year, you know. Um, we've done a lot of the legwork, so we can enjoy it a little bit more, I think, this time. What, what could go wrong, I mean? Do you want me to start the list now? <laughs> no, actually, no, I don't want to we... know what could go <laughs> wrong. Yeah. We have to charge up the batteries on the laptops, make sure they still work and, you know, just get them back from the various people who've been doing the homework on them and get rid of all the porn. And... <laughs> we should be good to go. It's the things that my government make it exciting. It's not only us that have got a load of work to do for the new gigs. Quite often, we bring together people who've not worked together before. Um, in this case, of course, bringing Liam Gillick and the band together was in some ways a, a classic MIF combination. The stack of synthesizer players um, could just have been, you know, a, a backdrop to a, to a concert performance. What he did was take that idea and, um, in a way, discover what it was about. What you've got to do is think about what New York represents. It's not the capital city, but it's the productive place. It's the place of production of ideas, of music, of contradictory cultures. And there is something in common there with Manchester. And this is where I try and have ideas. Bernard had lots of ideas already. They already had a lot of ideas structurally. And I wanted to work with those. I wanted it to be an actual collaboration. The focus would still be that it was a concert, that it would still be the music, that it would be them. But it would be them 
in a kind of slightly skewed way. I was very keen on the fact that this would be experienced as a concert and not a sort of weird art event with music by. It's really, in a sense, closest to sculpture. So even if you're taking a room, people, an ambiance, lighting, that's still making something. It's like putting things together. It's that feeling of putting things together, taking them apart, putting them together again. That's the key. This is a song off our last album, Music Complete. It's called Plastic.
these days, one of these days, right when you want me, baby, I will be gone. Cause you're like plastic, you're artificial, you don't mean nothing, baby, so superficial. The choice of songs for this collaboration was, like everything else in this project, very carefully considered. <laughs> what did you put on the drum with this? Stray or two? No, it's like there's a little <laughs> What we didn't anticipate was how long choosing the songs would take. It required a certain amount of mental acrobatics to try and get you in the headspace where you could detach yourself from the normal two-hour set that would play. It was weird. But it was good, cos you forget about a load of songs, and it's nice to bring them back. So I think it took about three days, didn't it? About yeah. three days, three days. Of listening to everything. I wouldn't say it was enjoyable. I wouldn't say it was arduous. It was quite revealing, cos some of the songs you'd hear me go... Oof. You know, what was I thinking? We started with the first very first New Order album and sort of chronological order. And all of us had sort of favourites as well that we wanted to present. So we sort of made a list out of this. There was a yeah. lot of lists, yeah. yeah. There was easy, hard and difficult. We just went for the most difficult. It's not as great as Titcher. And I like that about it. You can revisit some, you know, corners of the catalogue and it's a big catalogue now. Pick the ones we thought were, were good but also the ones that we thought uh, would be suitable for the synthesizer orchestra. So they had to have a certain amount of keyboards in them. Like True Faith being like the biggest one, you would just say, well, well right, OK, well, that's, that's going to be dramatic if we don't do that, and it's going to be dramatic if we don't do Blue Monday. So that's it, OK, we're not going to do those. It's a funny one, Blue Monday, because it is essentially what it is. It's not really a song. And if you try, it's not. And if you try and make it get too musical with it, it loses something somehow, and, it, it, and then it, it just gets a little bit, I don't know. Too posh for its own good. I'm sure they could have played it anyway. Oh, we could have, they could have played it, but it would have been, it would have been very hard because there's not that much in it, apart from that. Like, they could have got very elaborate on the string bits, I suppose. So I think what's good about it is that they did go for things which are quite surprising. What this project is, it's not about nostalgia. We're trying to work at what can be done now. We're trying not to look backwards, I think. I tended to... Uh, pick some of the older songs I wasn't involved with because <laughs> you, you work so much on the ones you are involved in. When I was a kid, I had that uh, Unknown Pleasures album and I listened to it religiously and, you know, if, it, if you'd have told me that I'd be playing Disorder with a couple of members of Joy Division, I wouldn't have believed you back then. It's, you know, that, that's um, really good to have that in the set. OK, let's give it a go. Just before another day I 
got the spirit, there's a feeling. Take the shot. I think honestly it came up purely as that's a really cool song. It's Why has really that one song. been forgotten about? Let's get it in the set. It's been long enough now here in Bernard and, and the guys talk about it with regards to Joy Division. I feel like they can come back to those songs and play them and do them justice. Where Ian's suddenly in the room or with you? Yeah. Um, well, certainly singing that song and singing any of his lyrics, so I always get an image of him. And obviously, he's forever young in that image. He's there and he's remembered and he's cherished the thought of him, all of us, I'm sure, every, everyone who's involved with him. It was terrible what happened with him. He was such a determined, explosive character. I don't think there's anything that we could have done to change things apart from locking him up 24 hours a day and not stopping him from doing that. You can never really deal with suicide successfully because you're inevitably always going, what if, what if? I do question, really, how long Ian Curtis would have stayed in music. I don't think that his health was up to it, to be honest. And the three surviving members of Joy Division made the decision to carry on because that's who they were. Between Stephen, Bernard and Peter Hook, there was a, there was a chemistry. The chemistry that had underpinned Joy Division. And they did demo sessions and finally they came to a result which was the four members of New Order. It was all a bit awkward. Cause, when I joined? Yeah. Yeah, it was very awkward. It was very awkward. The fact that a lot of Joy Division fans didn't like it, it was a great thing to me. That when they kind of got quite, quite annoyed <laughs> <laughs> with what the, what the bloody hell are they doing? They bloody they didn't like that enjoying <laughs> themselves. <laughs> The when she started playing with the band, I always watched her, because I'm curious about this role, like where she stood in relation to the others. I think just having a female in the band um, adds a level of temperance to our behaviour. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, we all behave a lot better. Reinvention came after the first album, after Movement. Yeah. Movement was kind of Son of Joy Division, in a way. To me, to my ears, I'm not very keen on that album. I think they all said to us that on Movement, it was pretty much them trying to work it out for themselves and, and, and going forward. Bernard seemed to feel literally... I think so. He looked physically uncomfortable listening to that album again, and I don't think he ha has listened to it since it was recorded, because I think he was just finding his feet as, as a, a singer, singer at the time. And Bernard gradually... He starts to find the voice, a voice that hadn't really existed before, which is uh, romantic at times, very dark at times. I never in my life dreamed of being a singer never appealed to me. I didn't want to be the centre of attention and I didn't want to sing. There was no alternative. The alternative was just to fail or fall into a life of nothingness. That we needed to break new ground and the way to do that was with new technology. We couldn't really afford to buy a commercial equipment in the early days, which is strange because we could afford to buy the Hacienda. <clears throat> and we couldn't afford to buy these instruments, so we used to beg, borrow and steal whatever we could and, and whatever we couldn't. 
or I would build it. You've got to remember, you've got to rewind the clock. In those days, like a DMX drum machine or 808, 909 drum machine or a new sequencer, a new synthesizer was really pretty groundbreaking technology. It's not like it is now. We took the technology as far as you could take it in the first day of ownership. First, Steve was a bit resistant to both synthesizers and drum machines, but when he realised it, it wasn't going to put him out of a job, he embraced it and became extremely proficient at um, using both of those things. There really was no need to worry because of um, everybody that's ever been in New Order, there's only me who's boring enough to read the manual. <laughs> I could have never, ever written music for an orchestra, but I could program a computer with a bunch of synthesizers on the end and achieve something really similar. And I listen to all sorts of music and because I believe that in every genre of music, there's something good. So I had this idea for this kind of, I don't know, is it Baroque, the, the, the harpsichord bit? I programmed that up in a spare bedroom, you know, just, just that bit. <laughs>
Manchester isn't just our home, it's also home to one of Europe's leading conservatoires. The Royal Northern College of Music was the perfect place to recruit more than a dozen keyboard players and vocalists to form the synthesizer orchestra. I made another sound to add to your original sound. Right. To just make it a bit more synthy. Who to four that play it? It's there. Well, so put your hands up, students. <laughs> Digging into those tracks, deconstructing them, reconstructing them, reimagining them with the synth orchestra has been a really in-depth piece of work. The project that they've kind of embarked upon is brave. It's brave for Liam, and it's actually brave for New Order. But, of course, it's good in that it's put the group back into an uncomfortable space. The early years, the formative period, was an uncomfortable space. It's not been done before, so it was an experiment. We've never done anything like it before, so there's a, a lot of technical challenges, a lot of sounds to make, a lot of scoring to do. We knew it was going to be difficult, but it took us all by surprise. I think New Order being New Order always enjoy a, a challenge with technology and what would be involved in working with 12 keyboard players. Steve finds it interesting, the technological side of it, which is unusual for a drummer. And a lot of the stuff for these gigs he put together, the technical aspect of it. I think he took on a bit more than he could chew. I think at one to point, Stephen was having about three hours sleep a night. Well, I was worried for him. No, he was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> you, always hurt the one, you always hurt the one you love. Impossible to live with. <laughs> My role with New Order was to kind of collate all the uh, MIDI information that's usually played by computers and then rearrange that for 12 synthesizer players. There's a lot of information running around, hell of a lot of cables. There's also the music they have to read and they also have another screen which I'm on. Playing this kind of music, you've got to have a feel as well, mm. but it's not just about you know, being a, a shit-hot musician. You've got to get it. I mean, it was great that they could play stuff that fast, cos it hadn't been written that way. It had all been essentially programmed on a sequence and nobody actually went... <laughs> and it was like... Ding, 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 and you speed it up. Two, three, four. OK. I was surprised that Joe could write down the way that they should play them. If we did it all on a computer, there would be less layers. So the idea with what we're doing is split uh, this music off into more layers and, and more subcomponents. But you also get the different little variance in timing that gives you a different quality to it. So some people, for instance, were actual bass players, so they just naturally found themselves in the bass department of the synth orchestra, if you like, where some of the more classical players were more suited to the more flowing, sort of lyrical lines. We found, you know, the right sort of place for everyone, I think. It was a bit easier for me, because, you know, the students were taking up a few parts, <laughs> which I didn't mind. What this project kind of encapsulates is an extraordinarily grand and long story. The convergence completes, to some extent, a, a, a cycle and takes in an awful lot along the way. So the whole journey has just been, it's been a bit surreal so far that we've been able to do this. When the email came round telling us to apply to this, we didn't know yeah. it was going to be with New Order. We just told it was a high profile band. And yeah, it's been extraordinary. Mm. <laughs> so we just walked in here and I saw Stephen Morris, who's one of my favourite drummers ever, just sitting here and that was ridiculous enough in itself. I don't know, do you find yourself doing a bit of an act? <laughs> that, uh, an act. You know, well, you know, you don't want like to disappoint them by being too... Normal? Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Out of all the bands, I think, who are part of that Manchester legacy and that history, I think that a lot of them reflected Manchester in the music, you know, early Smiths, did, you know, Oasis did for a time. All bands reflect the environment that they're, they're in. 
that came out, say, in Kevin Cummins' famous portrait of them on the Hume Bridge in the snow. Again, you've got the city. You haven't got the group in a studio. You've got them in the city, in their environment, which is reflected in their music. When people used to say that, it's, it's, it's rubbish. But there's some truth in that, that you can't, you can't help it. It's just seeps. In the early days when we were in Joy Division, in early New Order, it wasn't as quite swish as this. It wasn't swish at all. It was post-industrial decay. In a way, that wasn't very inspiring, but in a way, it was really inspiring because in the middle of winter in uh, Manchester, surrounded by all these shut-down, closed factories with smashed windows, I think it affected the type of music that you made, you know, it may have contributed to the kind of sound that you had. That sense of the city has always been in Joy Division and then in New Order. And also because New Order became the biggest group, Factory became the biggest label. Anybody that you talk to will tell you that it was pretty chaotic at the time. But clearly there was a driving spirit. Often that spirit is embodied in the idea of Tony Wilson, but it obviously ran through a whole bunch of people. Rob Gretton, who was Joy Division's manager, was the heart and soul. He understood the music was very involved with the city. Rob Gretton and Tony Wilson died far too young, but their contribution to Manchester, to the city, was incalculable. And that is an incredible legacy. Both Rob and Tony really, really loved Manchester. And try and put something back into the place where you live and it'll be a better place to live. It's quite a simple concept, really. That's what they wanted to do. But they didn't tell us if that's what we wanted to do. <laughs> and those things were just, you know, a kind of naive and about idealistic attempt to do things better. You know, the Hacienda was incredibly naive, but it was a, you know, its, its premise was to do things in the way that you would have them done for yourself. And Tony had this vision of Manchester being regenerated. It happened in 89-90, and a lot of which came out of the Hacienda nightclub, which started in 82 and by 88-89 was one of the biggest nightclubs in the country. And you have this idea of Manchester as a cultural force. They expect Manchester to turn into what it's turned into today. I mean, it couldn't have got any worse, to be quite honest, so the only way was up. Um, but I don't think it had anything to do with us being in a band. It's nice to think of that you could possibly change things. It's like New Order is part of Manchester. At every corner you turn, there'll be some kind of reference. Part of the DNA. The two go hand in hand, really. You can't underestimate the impact of Factory on the city and the impact of Factory on the reputation and feel of the city beyond its borders across the world. And without a doubt, it was an inspiration to the very fabric of the city. And it has continued to be an inspiration because it's then carried on by others. The city's regeneration, the city's reputation for art and culture, the Manchester International Festival itself. I don't think any of that will have happened without Factory. And Factory wouldn't have happened without Joy Division and New Order. I wasn't born in Manchester, but it was the music of Manchester that made me move to this city in 1993. I'd like to think of myself as an adopted French mank. Uh, <laughs> Living here for 24 years, I just love everything about this city, the people, the culture, the music. Seamless transition, it was, was it, coming to Manchester? Completely seamless. Yeah, yeah sure, yeah. yeah. Like joining New Order, in fact. Absolutely, yeah. You know, it's a tough job coming into the band, no doubt about it, because uh, there's a lot of history. The focus seemed to be on me, you know, replacing 
Peter Hawk and uh, stepping in his shoes. There was a chemistry that somehow fitted together. You know, the friction of that chemistry obviously became difficult. But that, that's often how it is. I mean, chemistry is combustible. I was encouraged to do what I, I do as a bass player. Tom succeeded. He's great to get on with. He can play anything. On Music Complete, he came into his own. Not that the, all the other bass in our history wasn't great. It was great. How can I put it? It was. It felt like it was a new band and a, a new start. The band means a lot to people, so all you can do is do your best and interpret the songs and play them how you want to play them, but respect the history of it, really. Joe, yeah. we put a bit of modulation on the strings over there. I know it's just like hell no, but I think it's, it's giving it a bit of movement. Aha! Hello. Hello. Hello.
number one here? Could I have more um, orchestra? A, a, a little bit more, not like loads. Okay. When you actually do it on stage with the orchestra and the lights and everything in the boxes, that's what makes me feel, God, this is amazing. The stuff that Liam did, I mean, that was a real surprise. Actually seeing the thing, because we're looking at the pictures, oh, it's all right, but I mean, <laughs> it's never going to work. <laughs> what you have to remember, of course, is that we're building a kind of a machine here, and that was always my intention. So they're not just standing there and pressing buttons, they're reading music and playing. So the computer's there for them to read the music, and it's scrolling. Each player's got to have an individual score. Each player's got to have an individual sound. The program changes throughout the song. They've got to have a camera so they can see the conductor. And they've got to be able to communicate with us and the sound people by microphones, so incredibly complicated. That's just sheet music. Every different track, there's like different instruments that you're playing, and you're playing more than one instrument per track as well. They're like patch changes within one tune you can have two, three or four sounds. But it's just like, you read that one, you hit that one, <laughs> you sing into that one, and you look, and at, you look one. at that one. <laughs> so 12 seem to work musically and seem to work visually, and you start to find a kind of balance at that point. And you've got these cells. Oh, yeah, don't press I think it. that's like the, if you want everything to stop, like if you've got an arm caught in it and you yeah. didn't want to die. If you like the... put your arm through there, because you're having such a good time, <laughs> and then <laughs> it closes and your arm snaps, then you'll have to somehow lean over, hit that, and the whole thing stops. Just <laughs> well, Why would you put your arm in there? I don't know. Just getting so into it. <laughs> What Liam did was really think through the visual logic of that. He introduced the idea of the blinds, the sense that there was something about revealing and not revealing in this whole visual world. Conceptually, I was thinking a lot about the book Jealousy by Alain Robrier, which is really a book about voyeurism. In French, jealousy is the same as jealousy, which is the same as Phoenician blind, like some of you can look through. So. Yeah, I wanted to play not only with the idea that you can't always see them properly or that they're silhouetted. I wanted those young players to have moments in the concert where they can see the audience, but the audience can't really see them. When you go and stand up in those things, and when they're all shut, you've got a little slit, you can see the whole audience, because they are actually wood in the end. They're affixed to a mechanism that's connected to the same computer that's running the music, the same computer that's triggering the lighting, the same uh, signal that's triggering the digital effects. I think for the players, it was uh, initially quite weird being in these kind of isolated cells. So they could all see the band and the audience and myself, but they couldn't necessarily see each other. Yeah, it's pretty strange to be honest. You kind of feel, it's like you're really connected to everything, but you, you're isolated in this one part. So until we poke our heads through in between tunes to go, this is amazing. Everyone is slightly autonomous. Everyone's in slightly their own world. And that also accentuates, like, the way people behave. When you see the students in the synthesizer orchestra, and they're kind of indie dancing a little bit, you know, and they're behind, and they're having fun. It's a bit like dancing in your bedroom, but 2,000 people are watching. You'll catch something out of the corner of your eye and see one of the uh, players the doing some dancing, crazy dancing. Or... I found it's quite liberating, to be honest. It's more, probably dance more on these gigs than when I'm out and about. <laughs> there was a mad, like, uh, Twitter rave after the first oh, gig last yes, year because yeah, yeah, yeah. all the dan uh, people were dancing in the pods and it was trending more than you ordered. <laughs> <laughs> people might think, you could just do any concert in any venue, but I think with the very specific nature of the installation side of things, it's not as easy as that. There are complexities about how it will fit in the different venues, so there's been some tension around that because the spaces are different. Right from the beginning, I thought this needs to be modular. It needs to be able to be reconfigured because I just know that from doing exhibitions. Here, we're kind of like trying to fit something that was for one space into a different kind of space. Oh, gosh. Wow. I need to see it from the front, really. 
fight, Liam. Hello. How are you doing? Found it, all right. That was cool, yeah. What do you think? I see what you mean about the height restrictions now. The ceiling's not tall enough for us to have two rows of boxes, so we're twice as long. I'm secretly happy that we're in a venue where we cannot do what we did before, because it's too low in the middle. I wasn't sure if it was just going to look really sort of elongated in a, yeah. in a different structure. That's cool, actually, isn't it? it, it I think it looks it good. the room. Being in a structure like this, it's good because um, it kind of reflects what New Order are all about. One of the things that's great about this project is to bring a really strong visual statement right back into the heart of the music. They haven't worked with a visual artist in the same way. In this case, you do have this kind of creative autonomy. And I tell you why, because there's a phrase that isn't used very much, which is, I won. I like and I want aren't used that much in this case. And I like that. <laughs> it's about operating in parallel to something, and that gives you a lot of freedom. That was the factory way. You trust somebody to do something. On a bigger scale, that's how factory had always dealt with you know, New Order. Nobody told New Order what they should sound like. They were given creative autonomy, and they wanted creative autonomy. They have also then given creative autonomy to the people that's been working around them. So actually, the collaboration element is then becomes stronger, because instead of it ever being a kind of weird compromise, people actually follow their own practice and do it their way. Somebody makes a video, or someone does some artwork. The same, I mean, very much applied to me with the covers. You've always had this fine art element of interest in the group and of interaction with the group's music. It's not necessarily something that the group are always aware of, but it does inform them and, and sets them apart from your run-of-the-mill 80s electro mob. My interest in Joy Division and New Order at the beginning influenced my decision to go to art school. They were much more influential on me than any artist I could think of. There was a fundamentally different relationship between myself and Joy Division to that which then kind of evolved over the next decade with New Order. There was a personality to Joy Division which I could only complement, have a kind of a, a dialogue with that personality. The absence of Ian, let's be straight about it, the absence of Ian leaves a space around the group. The visual work steps into that space. So the covers are not about the music. Nobody wants to talk about the music. Nobody wants to say what any of it is about. No one is necessarily that sure what any of it's about. We didn't want to be marketed like a product. The music was good. The image that that record projected should, should be just as good. When I was a teenager, when I bought a piece of music, I always thought I was buying two pieces of art. I was buying the album music and I was buying the album cover. So I wanted a great piece of music and a great cover, and sometimes, occasionally, I would just buy a record for the cover. I was really disappointed <laughs> that someone could come up with such a great cover and then play the record afterwards, and it was a load of dross. That isn't to say that they are totally hands-off and will accept anything, you know, but they, once they've trusted somebody with a job, then that person is allowed to express themselves in the same way that they're allowed to express themselves. The covers are conceived of independently based on my own kind of tracking of a zeitgeist through that period. There isn't a singular language. You know, they're a journey through the canon of the 20th, 20th century art and design, which was my own journey. They never said they liked them. I remember calling Rob once about Blue Monday, or, and, I, and I said, does anyone like it? And he said, that they don't much mind it. And, and in fact, there was not a collective, we like this, until um, the cover of Regret. 
Uh, and Bernard said, I think you're getting the hang of it. His artwork stands in its own right, in, in the way I look at it. It stands on its own merit. Liam's project is his dialogue with his idea of New Order, as applies to other people who they might work with. It's those other individuals' idea of New Order that they come to engage with. And grids are almost autographic in Liam's work. And of course, his project with New Order is a grid. And in this instance, the grid has to accommodate humans and actions and performance. When you look out in Vienna, you're going to see architecture. We go back to the double-decker thing. That's in a rather beautiful, almost Baroque theatre. A lot of art and music collaborations, you really have like a big stupid art show with some music tacked on that kind of just uses music that way around. I wanted to create a frame, and here you literally are in a frame. I mean, it's exactly a frame.
I know the venue for this show here in Vienna is in the most beautiful part of the city, the Museum Quarter. But when I'm on tour, I always like to try and get out and see a, new, a few new things in every city I visit. I've not been here before, and uh, I've not got a great head for heights. Um, we're not going up there, are we? We don't have to go up there. It's obviously a, a reference to the film The Third Man, which is a um, film noir. I hope we're shooting this in black and white. Yeah, that film encapsulates the atmosphere of Vienna around the time of the Cold War, just after World War II. It's a bit like a Joy Division song, you know. It's got that kind of odd, weird atmosphere in it. On paper, our survival shouldn't have happened, really. We abandoned all the work that we'd done in Joy Division and never played any Joy Division songs for 10 years after the death of Ian. So the odds were stacked against us anyway after Ian died because we couldn't be Joy Division Mark II. We were interested in success or being famous or any of that. We just wanted to travel around the world having fun, and that's what we did. And as a byproduct of having fun, we became successful. It's not entirely being fun. A lot of it <laughs> has been quite traumatic, but um, most of us are still here. I think it's because we've worked it out together as a group of people. When there was a lot of things happening, continually happening, I was thinking, is this normal? Or have we been singled out as a band for all these things to happen to, you know, like all the deaths? And when you think, does someone cursed us? <laughs> things seem to go OK for other bands. Why is it such a bumpy road for us? 
I had to say, what doesn't kill you makes you strong. These last few years have been fantastic. Just let's please nothing else go wrong, please. <laughs> We're enjoying it now. Let it be. We've had enough shit. I can't imagine what happens next. I'm already kind of thinking, OK, so they're going to close this chapter and a new chapter's going to open. And so it's going to be different. And it's always different. I think it's in the band's DNA to go forward, to always seem to want to take risks and, and be creative and try something new. Collaboration. Very refreshing for us because normally when we're doing our normal touring, it's just the band, you know. It's been a great deal of true graft to get to where we are now. But quite enjoyed it. I enjoyed working with the students and the band and Joe. I know it's a terrible cliche, but we make a good team and we do. Every now and then someone says, so that must be really great working with New Order, and I say it's really something. And nothing else I've ever worked on has been really something. And I mean it's really something. I don't mean it's really nothing, I mean it's really something. I'm prepared for the fact that it won't feel good to go back home. They're all going away to do <laughs> other things and we'll be stuck here <laughs> playing in a band on our own. Yeah. I suppose it's been a a roller coaster of emotions, like all big projects are, and it's now reaching a conclusion. The last gig, and I think, yeah, especially the the encore will be quite sort of emotional. I think uh, decades. It's possibly the most beautiful song that New Order and Joy Division ever produced. Really, so to end the show with that one is, you know, it's quite. It gets you. It always gets me. I think it was very smart. I was a bit surprised, but I think it was very, very smart. So moving, dangerously moving in a way. I remember them when they were young, very young, and I was very, very young. <laughs> and here we are with a bunch of 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds playing behind them, and the words of decades are what you have to listen to. written by a young man, right, who's no longer with us, the words written by a young man who died young, being sung in front of a group of young musicians who are, you know, taking each part of it and breaking it down and bringing it together again. It all comes together in that song. It's added a new and fresh, exciting dimension and a little bit of rebirth as well to New Order. And it's always good to occasionally have a little reinvention as time goes by, I mean, you can't reinvent the wheel, but you can change the tires. <laughs> okay, we're going to end tonight with a, a song by Joy Division. We've not played it a lot of times, and it's it's a really beautiful song off the album Closer.
Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Vitesen. <laughs>